Okay, uh, welcome everyone. Um, I'm here with Joshua Hansen, and we have decided to do a conversation all about Paul Virilio. So I think to start off, maybe I'll give it over to you and just baseline introduction, int introduce Virilio as if I'd never come across him before. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, so again, I'm Joshua. You know, one of my main interests is uh, hypermodernity. So like Virilio is central to that. And he's a French cultural theorist. And he kind of touches on all these like, you know, he's one of the most radical and uh, original thinkers, like probably, you know, the 20th century. And he's somebody who deals with the warfare, technology, uh, architecture, aesthetics, uh, you know, speed, basically everything. And uh, so he's born, you know, in Paris, like in the 1930s and stuff like this. And he regarded himself as a uh, as like a child of the Blitzkrieg. I think that's like a direct quote from him. And so kind of like the point is he's like, you know, a young child while the Nazis are invading France. And uh, so he, he's, he grows up in that milieu and that like really shapes his experience. Uh, he has all these like really unusual themes like uh he was able to evade nazi capture through like a type of cryptic architecture inside of his family home uh so that becomes a theme that he gets interested in and then sort of in the post-war period you have all these sort of like abandoned uh you know german bunkers like on the french coastline the atlantic wall and he goes and does like a phenomenological investigation of these uh that he called bunker archaeology and so he's just got all these you know completely unique uh you know thematic vectors that he's interested in uh you know such as like i don't know gray ecology he's talking about the accident and substances the university of disaster all this stuff. And he's also somebody who's connected with and was like directly embedded in like the milieu of French thought, you know, during that time frame. And we're talking like all the heavy hitters of like French theory and philosophy. So Baudrillard, uh, you know, Derrida, Deleuze, um, you know, Merleau-Ponty and more. And he even like, he even personally worked with like some artists such as like Matisse he had like a personal relationship with so incredibly interesting guy completely prolific uh he's wrote you know way more it's got to be way more than 25 books you know th this is one of my favorite guys you know there's some drawbacks which is uh like maybe one or two drawbacks are he kind of has a scattergun sort of style it's been described as and he sort of invents a lot of words, some of which, you know, I personally don't necessarily think that they work. But that doesn't change the fact that, you know, I think that even, you know, he passed away 2018 uh, or something like this. And, you know, so like a, a lot of his uh, a lot of his best work is like, you know, in 2000, between 2000, 2010, I'm almost always surprised, you know, by by how prescient uh some of these themes that he uses are so uh you know basically i'm a big fan in spite of the fact that you know some people from the scientific community have critiqued him uh you know because kind of he's he's been a little loose with language here and there so they'll take that and try to disqualify him when you know all things considered i think that he actually has been more accurate in his predictions than the scientific community so they want to dismiss him uh you know because he's critical of you know, let's say like extreme science and so forth. And, you know, we'll get into it. But uh, anyway, you know, I think that uh, he should be fundamental for, you know, for this century. Yeah, thanks. That was really good. That's, that's really interesting. Um, yeah, like from for me, I came across him originally. Someone screenshotted like a passage. It was like during the, the peak of the lockdown, someone screenshotted a passage of his of one of his texts. I think it was Christopher Lash's Angry Ghost. I don't know if you follow him on Twitter, but. Um, so big shout out to Christopher Lash's Angry Ghosts. Uh, so I, 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 from that screenshot, I was like, wow, this guy's onto something. And then from there, you know, I'm kind of a few books in. So, um, some yes, yeah, like, uh, some of the themes, which really, um, I thought he, he did really well was like talking about public emotion and kind of mass affectation. And this, um, this really kind of helped me understand the ideological turns of the 21st century and particularly the 2010s. And I think particularly when we started seeing politics and the internet really 
kind of colliding in, in the way it did, especially with the Trump-Clinton election. And then with obviously with the lockdowns and stuff, the use of mass communication in this very suspicious way and kind of seeing the, the very negative sides of mass communication, uh, this kind of instantaneous communication. And um, the, the quote he has, which he kind of repeats in different forms throughout his, his entire uh to like every I've only, okay I've only, i think i've read four of his books so i'm not saying i've read like nearly enough of his stuff to really speak with like total authority but every single text i've read he's mentioned something along something along the lines of the big switch from the 20th century to the 21st century in terms of propaganda has been the switch from um the uh standardization of opinion to the synchronization of emotion and i think that that really helps understand a lot of the kind of irrationality of what we're seeing going on in the past few years. Um, and obviously the weaponization of science is, and the kind of breakup of reason and science in this kind of strange sense, which is, which is people hear that and they go, what do you mean the breakup of reason and science? Science is pure logic and pure rationality. And it's, very, it's a very complicated thing because you have to take the whole context in. As a cultural theorist, he takes the whole into account. Not just He's not just looking at particular like scientific claims. He's taking in the whole of like, Stuff you would talk about perhaps in academiology to do with like the research institutions and, and all this, like the, the debt structures and all of this kind of like outside stuff that you don't really see on the surface level. Um, so he's kind of applying that to, to kind of science as an industry nearly. Um, and um, I think this, yeah, uh, as you were saying that when you're reading him, it is like he's kind of dealing with so many themes all in, in, in like, one go and you're kind of like where does this all add up how does this all interconnect so he, he's a difficult read like you know you really have to sit down with him it's he's not an easy read he's a difficult you just, you just sit down with him and really kind of have to you have to like let yourself be perplexed and he is also a french philosopher so it's inevitable that you're going to be a little <laughs> bit he's a bit bombastic and a bit he likes to come up with words as you say um but i, th I think once you can push past that like you really see this guy is on something um so that's just my kind of basic um, kind of introduction of like how I kind of came across him and stuff. Um, so it's, it's, it's great. To, it's great to also know someone else who's, who's reading him in detail. And I think that he, he, I think that he's going to become much, much more recognized over the next five years. I've heard a few people already just random podcasters and stuff. I don't know if you've noticed this kind of say really, oh, really, like you kind of see him coming into coming into recognition a little bit. Um, so I don't know if you want to have any uh, more comments on, on how you came across him and stuff, or do you want to go straight into the reading? The only thing I would add to that is just that, uh, like, I, you know, I've watched him speak, uh, and he, this is usually like in French or whatever. So I only understand a couple words here and there, but, uh, you know, watching him speak is very interesting because, you know, he kind of self-identifies as somebody who is very extreme, you know, radical in his positions and so on and so forth. But uh, I just get a kick out of it because even though I didn't quite understand what he was saying, uh, you know, he does have like a certain uh, charisma and presence, uh, you know, where he is really like, you know, he's almost like explosive, uh, you know, like in person, uh, even like, you know, in his late like 70s or whatever it was. Uh, the guy's a real character. So uh, I found that fascinating. And then um, I did I have seen some stuff about this Uh I saw like a uh, there was a talk that they did somewhere in New York and like Mackenzie Wark was there. And, uh, you know, it was like commemorating Paul Virilio, you know, after he had passed away. What was said is that uh, Virilio kind of invites you to theorize sort of like from inside of the accident. You know, I think that that is a perfect characterization of what we're talking about there. Yeah. Yeah, no, great. Yeah, that's um. I, I think accidents is he's like I think the 21st century in general he's very much like I think the leading philosopher of the 21st century not in the sense that he's like a living philosopher because he's dead in the 21st century but like literally of what happened from that transition of the 21st century taking over w what are the kind of leading kind of um, uh, philosophical dilemmas and cultural forces and so on going on um, so the text that we read was the original accident. We're going to have a much longer conversation about what he's saying in this text, but do you want to do a little introduction or a little summary to that text? Sure. That's great. And uh, yeah, so the original accident, 
Uh, one thing I have noticed, because I have a number of the texts, I haven't read his whole canon, but, you know, that he is like one theorist that I probably am going to, you know, make a solid attempt. His entire corpus is all interconnected in, in many senses. And one main theme he's talking about is the integral accident. And so there's a couple of accidents that he's referencing here. One is the accident in substance. And uh, th this is somewhat complicated, but he kind of, uh, he appeals to Aristotle, who's talking about the idea that the accident reveals the substance. Of course, there's a, you know, there's a double meaning of the word accident, and there's been a historical transformation of this. And I don't claim that, uh, you know, that maybe Virilio's uh, analysis would satisfy some of the Aristotelians that may be among us. But in any case, basically what he's claiming is that the science is something that is increasingly revealing the accident. That's how I would summarize it. And uh, this gent, Ross Hamilton, who wrote a philosophical analysis of the accident, has basically, he indicates that Virilio here is claiming that the accident is basically a like a quality that adheres in substance. And so Virilio takes himself to be revealing the hidden face of uh, techno-scientific progress. And the quickest and easiest way to sum that up in this category would be that like, for instance, uh, through technological advancement, like when you invent the ship, you have therefore invented the shipwreck. When you've invented the airplane, you've invented the crash. And when you've invented the automobile, you've invented the pileup. And so now when we're talking about the original accident, we're talking about a certain potentiality here that's kind of like ontological in a way that almost maps on to, let's say, either the Eastern or Western uh, conception of either, uh, you know, you have original sin and ancestral sin, you know, depending on which figure you're following there. Uh, the claim would be something like this, like uh, 1986, you have like two events of unprecedented proportion. And what we're talking about here is uh, anthropogenic catastrophes. So for instance, the Challenger explosion on the one hand, and then Chernobyl, and, and these two incidents are like almost completely unique accidents that occur within, you know, like three months of each other or something like this during that time frame. And so like the, the idea here is that, um, you know, this it's almost like ontological and it seems as if this has not yet failed to present itself. Uh, so, you know, the accident is what crops up. It's what is eventually going to show itself. And, you know, again, this is showing, you know, the, what's being unconcealed here is the hidden face of uh, scientific and technical progress. That's basically the theme of the book, I would say. Yeah, great. That's, that's really good. So, yeah, I mean, this is all like if people are hearing this for the first time, they're going to be like, well, it's going to be, it's going to have a lot to take in. You're like the, the inner substance of, of technological invention is an accident. And, and like that, that, that sentence in itself is kind of mind boggling. You have, you have to, you have to sit with that for a while and go, what, you know, but um, for me, what I kind of, what, what, what I kind of got out of it was like, there was a kind of, a kind of ignorance through science, which was, which, which, which was emerging. Um, the the, the 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 phrase philofolly which he, is a kind of word he invents just like folly is in like stupidity and philosophy mixed together um a kind of thinking of stupidity i suppose um was something that stood out to me and was largely something i think he was trying to express in this kind of breakup of science and reason and this um i suppose inability inability for the inventors to really understand what they're doing when they're when they're creating something like, like they really don't they really don't have the kind of grasp of the consequences of this tech piece of technology or of the action and so on um and i think one of the notes i wrote down i can't remember if he said this or i just wrote this as a note i think he probably said it but um it was like the, the kind of accident it, it's it, it's beyond the knowledge of the engineer the, the guy the person making it is 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 creating something which exceeds his um, kind of immediate understanding. Um, so I suppose there's there's the accident itself, and there's the um, the uh, conditions in which the accident occurs, right? So uh, that's kind of that's kind of one of the ways I was thinking about it. Um, 
this kind of historical breakup of science and reason or the in, in in one quote he had about philophily he kind of says something about the mad scientist is is the kind of key figure um he says he says something like i'll, I'll actually just read out the quote um Okay, yeah, here it is. So he says, here is the ultimate figure of philofolly, that is to say, of the, sorry, of the accident in knowledge whereby man affirms all by his very existence, embraces all, including himself, within the closed circle of knowledge. Then within the limits of this closure, something outrageous lies in wait, not as, not as in the exile of madness experienced by the deviants locked up in asylums in the 19th century, but in the exodus of the philophily of the high and mighty, those mad scientists, once stigmatized by Swift, I'm not sure what Swift is here, but anyway. Jonathan Swift. Jonathan Swift. Oh, okay, okay. I thought it was like an organization which like regulates yeah. scientific technology. <laughs> anyway. we, we need one. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> it's not a bad idea. <laughs> but anyway, he says, he says rendered. So um, those mad scientists, once stigmatized by Swift, rendered powerless by the maniacal outrageousness of discoveries that aren't so much superhuman as fundamentally inhuman. So that was, and another part, he says, philophily is a love of what is repressed as radically unimaginable, whereby the insane nature of our acts would not only stop, stop consciously worrying us, but would thrill us and captivate us. So that part I kind of thought was like some sort of like techno hypnotism. Um, and obviously speed is kind of a, 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 a very much a, a theme of hypnotism, but kind of techno hypnotism in, in which we sort of just we just we just lose any sense of reality about what we're actually doing when it comes to scientific event scientific innovation. Absolutely, and so you know, like th these 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 original accidents that are sort of being created, uh, you know, all kind of signal back to this integral accident. So, like in his body of work, he traces out these accidents. Uh, like he basically has invented like. Uh, an accidentology. And at one point he had like, I think it's a book that was actually like, a, it was supposed to be like an art exhibit in a sense. And it is, uh, it has to do with like a, a technical progress accident museum. And uh, so you have that on the one hand and his idea for the for the university of disaster would be, this is where like the arts and the sciences basically collectively reflect on these respective accidents in order to like develop a mode of preventative intelligence. But so he traces out accidents in a couple of uh, categories. So like obviously in the original accident, he starts talking about substances. So like creation, the ship and the shipwreck, but uh, you know, in the information bomb, he's talking about the accident of knowledge uh, and also extreme science. So here, like you could say that this, you know, we have this, uh, you know, the information bomb, this hyper specialized rational ignorance, you know, where we just have an increasing amount of idiocy, you know, that one would have to pour through before they could find, you know, the, the good and the true, what have you. And so that would be one. And then also the accident in art is something that he has a text on that. And then he, he talks about basically the aesthetics of disappearance. And, uh, you know, so for instance, like Zoom culture associated with sort of like the COVIDian, um, you know, quarantine or what have you, you know, this would be something where, you know, there's a loss of the world. Uh, and so, you know, this is explicitly hypermodern. So you have an accident there, a science that threatens the possibility of the end of all science. Uh, you know, we're, we're talking about like maximal risk. Yeah, you have all that, uh, this idea of like systematic idiocy. I think that that's something that we definitely experience to the point where it's like institutionalized. And, um, you know, basically, uh, to, to, <laughs> I, I think that uh, this this sort of thing, the, obviously, the other text we read is, uh, you know, F uh, Francis Fukuyama, our post-human uh, future, uh, where he's talking about the uh, consequences of the biotechnological revolution. The, you know, the ultimate claim that I would make is that Virilio's analysis of this sort of ontological accident is something that is the best possible case you know, it kind of answers the cull of Fukuyama's book in terms of uh, an argument for the precautionary principle in biotechnology, which is something that is much more in effect in Europe. Uh, Fukuyama talks about this than it is in the U.S., 
where it's almost like, you know, sort of like the, uh, the initiative is on the side of, you know, the biotechnology corporations and the burden is on anybody who wants to question or challenge what it is that they happen to be doing. Uh, so, you know, I think that this is, there are some arguments from people like uh, Michael Sandel and others talking about bioconservatism, but, uh, you know, this is a pretty unique and, you know, it's almost like, to me, I think it's like analytically correct in some sense. Yeah, no, that's good. So maybe, maybe let's, we're going to get into uh, Fukuyama and uh, biotechnics, but let's maybe put that to side for one second because um i think uh i think one of the things i've been trying to like um make the association of is this sort of spatial philosophy of virilio in saying i think well, i think it was um uh the information bomb where he says the end of history is the end of geography and then you think about mass communication and you think about you think about like how these cultural um antagonisms to start somewhere in some city in the u.s suddenly become worldwide well, at least in the west anyway suddenly become worldwide you know uh, this sort of like complete this complete collapse of spatial distinction i think is really and like how this all inter interconnects with all the other themes we've been talking about is like a good question it certainly does it's just in what sense it does is, is is a tricky question but i definitely think like something that i've really picked up on is um this idea of pod world especially since COVID, but, you know, it predates COVID really, but um, which went kind of exaggerated itself with COVID is going to, this pod world is kind of spaceless. Um, I think you mentioned kind of world death or world loss. Um, um, this sort of, um, yeah, this kind of new strange scientific way, not scientific, but like kind of technophilic way of life where we are, our, our social relations are completely, are completely, simulated almost um you know you get your food delivered to you 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 have your friends online you kind of sit in your little cubby hole and everything is every, everything is simulated and i thought that the simu i thought that this at least fitted in well with the theme of the kind of weaponization of science because there's something about war which people don't often talk about and that's simulating so we have war games for example and then again i can't remember if if, if, if really mentioned this or or I think that it, what might have happened was that I wrote it on my notes. I think what happened was I was looking at Twitter and I saw something that Bill Gates posted about, about pandemic saying, we have war games. We also have to have germ games as in like the simulation of a crisis in order to prepare for a crisis. So you have this- from what I heard, they did in fact do that. The, yeah. uh, I, in one of his texts, uh, I think it's gray ecology what he talks about, and also in a couple other ones as well, he's talking about the acceleration of reality and what its effects are. And a very interesting claim that I think, you know, maps onto what you're saying there uh, that he makes is he's talking about the idea that, you know, the tremendous success of the techno scientific project is also like basically been its failure. And this is something that could connect to like Fukuyama, where he talks about Hegelian recognition as like a driver of history, because now we're at the point where, you know, the acceleration of reality is taking on, you, you know, it's almost uh, we we're at war with, you know, like the ecosystem in a certain sense. So, you know, people are accelerating the destruction of the ecosystem in order to achieve recognition you know, for offspring that may not have like an actual habitat at some point in the future. He's always talking about, you know, these crazy scientists, uh, such as like Hawking at the end of his life, you know, was talking about the idea of exoplanets. And, you know, some of these scientists express the notion like, you know, we'll be safe once we get to our exoplanet and so on and so forth. So it, it's just sort of unusual where if somebody is like a some sort of like strong social Darwinist, uh, they're almost, uh, you know, eradicating their own habitat as as a consequence of a vulture capital connected with techno science. You know, sort of what the uh, you know the incentives, uh, the, the incentive structure, and the way that it is presently formulated 
uh, something that he talks about is the idea that it's almost like a uh, it's almost like a reworking of like the story of Genesis, where with these sort of Apple computers, uh, you know, we have this information bomb that's going to potentially exile us from our own planet. That's one of the themes he uses there. Mm. Yeah, I, th- I, I think the the kind of um, response you've seen in the past few years of escape is is, is very much um present in this idea of like accelerating reality um like for example like uh, you know we're going to go to we're going to go to space we're going to live in the metaverse um there's this yeah there's this kind of inability and like these are this is often things that are said by you know science or kind of like industry leaders of scientific and technological endeavors and so on (laughs) and like all they have to offer is like further atomization and further kind of simulation of a, of, of a kind of fictitious reality and and further escape to it let's go to another planet let's uh, let's colonize another planet so um i think he would call this like you know the propaganda of progress yeah. and, and what it seems like it's doing is all of these sort of you know the hidden side of technical progress you know this integral accident and you know all of the all of the sort of like you know the idea that we're now facing mega risks you know the potential to basically wipe out the entire species uh, you know destroy the planet and now with biotechnology you know like basically break the being of the human species with these sorts of mega risks um, you know that this is unprecedented and basically what happens is it gets papered over with the propaganda of progress and then all the negative implications are outsourced you know basically to like the other side of the world i would say you know parts of like china at the present moment you know is kind of bearing the brunt of uh, you know what the consequences of the overall system have been and that is uh, you know that's cashed out in terms of human immiseration you know it's concealed it is uh, you know the burden is shifted and then you know there's a massive program of uh, of basically projection and gaslighting in order to you know re um, apportion the blame for all of this stuff funny do you mention china there because i think there's two things that china does actually in the kind of global capital system which um is is crucial and it's it's they buy they take debt they basically buy debt from the west and they also they obviously also is cheap manufacturing but the the, the interesting thing we kind of mentioned pollution and so on um is they buy like like uh trash they buy like rubbish they're actually like one of the biggest or they used to be anyway i'm not sure if they've changed now but they used to be one of the biggest um purchasers of western like just our 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 rubbish, and they I don't know what they do with it, but they do they were apparently doing something with it. So you see this like weird like industry of of waste, nearly. You know, we we were also discussing we've also we've also both read uh, Fukuyama's uh, biotech. What's the title of the book again? Sorry, I can't remember. I read this ages ago. It's a uh, this is post- uh, our post human future uh, consequences of the biotechnology revolution. And so this is written in, what year is this? Uh, this is 2002. And, uh, you know, all things considered, uh, you know, I think it's a pretty good text. I tend to disagree with Fukuyama, but, you know, he always is, uh, you know, very thorough. You know what I'm saying? He dots all his I's, crosses all his T's and all this stuff. Uh, can't say the same for some of his, you know, the radical Fukuyamas. Uh, you know, he has followers that like even stuff that he has like backed off on and he has limited and hedged on. He has some followers who seem to like what they do is they like absolutize, uh, you know, Fukuyama judgments. And then they sort of uh, they multiply that to infinity. And, you know, you could read a quote straight from Fukuyama to some of these radical Fukuyamas and they will not accept it. Yeah, I remember um, reading uh, that for the first time, and he has some really good like burns of uh, bioethicists. He has like one. I I think you tweeted one of them out. I think it, I did. I can't remember the exact quote, obviously, but it, it was just an absolute like you know it was it was a takedown of of bioethicists, ethicists, which was just like absolutely glorious. So um, I think Fukuyama, yeah, I, I, it's, it's the same with me. He's he he's observationally fantastic quite often, but he's his political prescriptions, I think, are quite limiting. Um, but one of the 
one of the reasons I suppose if this book is great because it, it is an attempt, I think, to kind of use philosophy and maybe political theory to an extent um, to kind of put the, uh, put the brakes on the mad scientist figure that, that Ver- Verilio mentioned before. I think that the uh, mad scientist figure has really, especially over the past few years, has really kind of uh, broken free from any sort of political or ethical shackles that, that he once was subject to. And uh, one example here, and I think the, 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 the kind of destruction or kind of self-destruction pretty much of the left, I think is a part of this because um, are the, an article, I think I put it off on my, on my YouTube channel, but there was an article that came out in the in Irish times. Irish times is basically like this. Uh, it's basically like the New York times or the telegraph of this kind of center, century technocratic kind of paper of Ireland. And um, it, it was discussing how after after COVID and the medical responses to COVID, which involved certain kinds of scientific medicine, which involved kind of gene, like I, I know very kind of minimal vulgar level of gene modification, but like some sort of genetic modification, that the kind of ethical boundary to, for example, GMOs, genetically modified organisms of food, um, was had, had been broken down. And this is a big topic in Ireland because there's a lot of agriculture in Ireland. There's a lot of debates that go on about should we be using GMOs or not? Because we're kind of in the European um, ethical boundary, which is much like, especially like Germany and France, like they're much more like, you know, high food standards, no no screwing with our food, keep that out. <laughs> and, then, and then Ireland's kind of a little bit of like, it's, it's quite influenced by the United States. A lot of like, you know, tech companies in Ireland don't pay in taxes and, you know, there's a lot of history of Irish people going over to America and so on. So there's a kind of, there's a kind of a close relationship there. And they're kind of like a good example of a, um, a, uh, a canary in the coal mine, because they'll be the first to go. If the GMO standards go, then they'll be one of the first countries to go. Um, and um, there is a, and of course the article was explaining that like, there's no left wing protest to this. There's no left wing reaction. The, 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 they, I think they even quoted one of the, um one of these one of these activists kind of or think tank institutions which is whose job it is 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 to kind of lobby or you know create awareness around genetic um modification they even came out with a statement around the same time as 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 covid which basically says something which they basically they, they basically just said okay we give up we we have we've we're not going to stand in your way anymore if you want to if you want to use genetic modification feel free so um, I think that boundary of the left is is gone, and I think the the Foucault book is great because he's he, he's not like this kind of like radical activist type. He's 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 a strange figure. He's he's kind of he's, he almost seems as a centrist, but at the same time he's qu- he's got quite like quite cutting edge and astute observations, and he understands the threat here. So I suppose um, there's a kind of theme of like where who's going to regulate the mad scientist in the future in the next. In the next century who because it's not going to be the left anymore so who is going to be there i found these quotes okay, uh, so this this is perfect so one uh here's a fragment he says uh, many bioethicists have uh have become nothing more than sophisticated and sophistic justifiers of whatever it is that the scientific community wants to do and then he's claiming that they, you know, they have enough knowledge of, you know, let's say Kantian metaphysics to beat back criticisms by anyone coming out of, you know, those traditions who might object more strenuously. So that, and then here's the other aspect. In any discussion of cloning, stem cell research, germline engineering and the like, it is usually the professional bioethicist who can be relied on to take the most permissive per, uh, position of anyone in the room. Uh, so I think that was the one that I had. And, you know, so that makes perfect sense. Uh, I, obviously, you know, I, I have noted the irony of this situation of where, you know, sort of opposition to GMOs, you know, all of a sudden you had sort of a um, internecine conflict over this issue when COVID arises and, you know, I am aware of like because of the double Dutch and the Irish sandwich or whatever, the tax loopholes that previously existed, there's a certain segment of the overall Irish, you know, uh, sort of economic sector that's very much connected to like global techno capital, what have you. Uh, so, you know, that makes perfect sense. 
Here is a quote from Fukuyama, another one that in light of, you know, Virilio's analysis of the original accident and the integral accident, I think this basically, this is actually perfect. Um, here's what he says. Um, the biotech industry needs to consider whether it is better to anticipate problems now and work towards formulating a system that serves its interests by assuring people of the safety and ethical nature of its products or wait until there is a huge public outcry following an outrageous accident <laughs> or horrifying experiment. So basically, you know, this idea of the, you know, the accident of substances, the accident of knowledge, uh, you know, this issue of the acceleration of reality, the aesthetics of disappearance, and so on and so forth. All of that relates directly to this. And exactly with what you're saying, where, you know, the E or like, you know, countries in Europe as it relates to like GMOs, for instance, have employed the precautionary principle, whereas in the US, you know, uh, basically, very much the opposite, the way that the burden is laid down, it's in favor of, you know, uh, accelerating, you know, involvement in, you know, biotechnology, and, uh, yeah. you know, the harvesting uh, of, you know, human biological materials, and so on and so forth. Yeah. And I think that the, the, the kind of larger point I was trying to make there with the example of the GMOs was that it was in a, 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 a time of global panic, fear, it, which was when these precautionary principles were lowered. Um, so I think that the, the, the kind of media system as a kind of arm to this kind of, sure. like, uh, this kind of techno biotechnical or kind of like weaponized science industry quite quite does quite well with a media whose first response to everything is like fear 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 you know so um so administration of fear and then yeah, you know there's something yeah. else that you know that i picked up on that i think is highly relevant to this is you know i've been interested in uh so like the, there's a very short essay by alistair mcintyre and it's called social science methodology as ideology and what he's claiming is that like social scientific methodology is the ideology of bureaucracy. And this is highly relevant to the present moment because of how it operates, which is that basically what is done is that, you know, selected scientific facts are sort of curated and then they are, you know, basically mashed up against non-scientific value judgments. And as a consequence of this, what is rendered through, you know, uh, it's bureaucratically administered is the putative so-called science. And so the issue with this is that uh, it, it, because it's hidden behind this sort of bureaucratic apparatus, it, it could operate like this. And this is what McIntyre points to. You could say, well, you know, we have some favorable experiments in this area, so we need more funding. Or you could say at the same time, you could say, you know, we haven't yet had successful experiments in this area, and that's why we need funding. So basically, the value judgment here, you know, there's already been a interpretive judgment that has taken shape before any actual scientific fact has been evaluated. And then, you know, this is how the so-called science is produced. And so Michael Sandel uh, from Harvard, you know, he pointed out the idea that it is kind of strange that like the idea of science has been reduced to a belief as in like, you know, you believe the science is like now a mantra, which is, you know, and so I think that this sort of uh, this notion of, you know, this is how this putative science is, is like bureaucratically, you know, it's like in a Weberian fashion, how it is rendered. This is something that accounts for, uh, you know, conflict, you know, in this particular category. Yeah, I mean, I think possibly like um, what we're seeing is the kind of technocratic assumption that science is, in a sense, it, it's detached from all of these ideological, political, and economic mechanisms. Um, is it, it, like that's the thing that's crumbling? I think in front of our eyes that it's it's not attached. Yes, the scientific method strictly. I mean, I, I'm not sure what you think about this, but. We, we, could we say the scientific method in a kind of abstract sense is 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 okay it's, it's what it is but 
the application when we inv- when we actually apply it to, for example, crises or things which in- things which involve um, this kind of more blurry world of the political and the ethical, that's when we run into trouble. Or would you push back and say there's something more even theoretically um, at fault with the scientific method, like from the very beginning? If that, I don't know if that makes any sense. I'd have to think about this. You know, I, w- I wouldn't want to venture something right off the bat, but, you know, I've been interested in like, like Latourian metaphysics, like Bruno Latour, you know, uh, laboratory life, you know, the social construction of science. And, you know, I think that there absolutely is a social construction of science in a sense that it operates according to, let's say, language. You know, I'm not saying like the quantitative aspect, I'm saying that the way that it's communicated ultimately picks up these cultural sort of uh, signifiers, affectations, you know, whatever. And uh, so there's a socially constructed aspect to it. But in particular, like, let's say the funding structure, the funding structure of science, you know, that's a that's a very interesting uh, mode of analysis there. Or you have the idea of the journal system where you have a bureaucratically administered, self-authenticating interpretive community of like academia and the sciences and so forth. And, uh, you know, what is the incentive structure there? And you know, I would argue that this is very different than, let's say, like, uh, Wilhelm von Humboldt and the idea of like this open-ended pursuit of scientific exploration, uh, you know, basically in the, uh, you know, in the post-enlightenment period that he's writing um, versus, you know, what we have today where now there's a biotechnology complex where major corporations are making decisions in universities uh, or within, you know, through the boards and so forth, pertaining to hiring decisions, research trajectories, and even like tenure decisions and stuff like this. And that's all been documented uh, in some very good, uh, you know, texts and, and, and so forth. And, you know, it all hinges on this sort of, uh, you know, the, the operation of this uh, social scientific methodology as itself an ideology. And um, so then, you know, as to constructivism, I'm not a pure constructivist, but I do think that there is an element of constructivism, you know, constructivism at play, of course. Yeah, yeah, I think I think I more or less agree. I think that that this that this area needs like, you know, I, I would be also cautious to make a kind of like clear cut judgment now. But this is definitely an area which needs to be. And I think it's, it's, it's biotechnology, which is going to force us to like radically reevaluate rather than just say, so for example, the kind of point I was making was like, you know, would it be enough to say, okay, we need like better political regulation of the influence of, you know, profit within science or um, the research institutions need to be more separate from the interests of companies and so on and so forth or weapon or weapons companies or military kind of like technologies and so on. We need to kind of better, distance between like research and academia and um and these these influences and you can think of someone like chomsky who's a good example who's like been involved in kind of political and ethical and activism but then his his institution is like the worst for like you know that's kind of like research sure. stuff so but or is there kind of like a deeper point to be made about um Here, here's a point that could be made like you know these are all, these are perennial uh, questions you're talking about no doubt yeah. you know and these are these are very difficult uh i think i'm gonna uh, i may like in the future address you know some of these scientific questions like you know specifically you know i'm gonna put it down to do that i think that there's a way that uh virilio is directly relevant to this question of biotechnology uh you know like how does the original accident apply here you know he has this this book and this idea for the university of disaster where the science and the arts uh the sciences and arts come together to basically evaluate the sort of ontological epistemic and otherwise consequences of you know this accident of technical progress and so on and so forth what this suggests like the integral accident the original accident is that we could look at a vector such as biotechnology and be like hey what is the accident here right and we can basically like deduce almost analytically if not quite 
you know, what is happening in biotechnology is we're breaking the being of the human species. That's literally what we're doing. We're getting into the DNA and we're now going to play around with it. And so what is like the, what is the consequence of this that, you know, is logically airtight that it will occur. And this is a sort of division, right? And so, you know, I think that it's clear cut that there will be a mode of division and then, you know, I know we talk about this, uh, you know, in terms of uh, for this talk is we both watched the 1997, uh, you know, this is like a hard sci-fi film called Gattaca, which is a movie basically about, you know, genetic engineering. And, you know, for one thing, it's a city that's literally spelled out in the language of DNA. That's why it's Gattaca. You know, it's spelled using the ATCG. Uh, you know, of the uh, nucleobases. And um, so the idea here is that a quote from the movie would be like, in this city, they perfected discrimination to a science. And, uh, you know, this is an amazing film. This is a real film. Uh, you know, the, the theoretical substance is of the highest level. You know, I think artistically, this is an excellent film. This is a real film. And for it to be like, you know, 2022, and this is from 1997, this film is absolutely prescient, deals with a lot of themes related to Virilio. You know, this is Ethan Hawke, Jude Law, Uma, Uma Thurman. And, uh, you know, basically in this in this film, you know, it's raising questions about determinism. It's raising questions about free will. It's raising questions about class struggle and, you know, what the potential implications of pursuing this biotech, uh, you know, genetic engineering pathway are, which Virilio, it states in a number of different places, he believes that it's going to lead to basically a potential cellular Hiroshima. Um, and I, I don't disagree with that. Yeah, no, I think I, I think you're right. I think that what's happening with, with biotechnology is that like it's exceeding just like it's exceeding a response which is merely political regulation or something like that. It, it, it would ha like it's an ontological boundary which is being crossed. So it's 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 deeper. It, it it needs a there's some sort of regulation if we could even use the phrase that exceeds you know what what is currently available within the kind of political structure. Um, but uh, because that, that that is what Fukuyama ultimately argues for in the book, um, he's quite he's quite radical in the sense that he says he says like you know, no, this you can't just be like this is all inevitable. We just have to deal with it. He's like, no, you need to regulate this shit. But then there's the question of like, well, what does that regulation look like and so on. But um, yeah, the 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 Gattaca film, yeah, we, we, that was like I, I'd seen that years and years ago, and I, I rewatched it recently when you recommended it, and it was yeah, it's a fantastic film and. Um, and uh, it, it, just so people know, the one of the great themes in it is that the the main character, I think Ethan Hawke, his brother is he's a birth baby. He's like a normal birth baby. His parents conceived them um, naturally, and his brother is like a is like a laboratory like designer baby, right? So you have this kind of like sibling rivalry being played out through through <laughs> through like this ontological division, and. Um, and uh, the, 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 he's born with lots of like, he, like kind of not lots, he's born with basic minimal um, kind of like health defects and stuff. Like he's got bad eyesight. He's, he's predicted to have heart problems when he gets into his midlife and so on. And the brother's like genetically perfect. And one of the scenes in the film, which I, I, I quite liked was because him and the brother keep having these races in, in the ocean. They keep swimming out in the ocean as far as they can to like challenge each other. And he keeps winning as in like the natural, the naturally born Ethan Hawke and his, his, his kind of like superhuman bio brother is uh, keeps losing. And then he, he keeps saving the brother because the brother keeps drowning. And then he, the brother asks him, how do you do this? And he goes, I don't hold anything for the journey back. I put it all in, all in on the way out, you know, so I, I'm like all in. So this is kind of like great, like um, kind of testament to like spirit, like to like giving yourself to something, which, which the kind of biotechnical um, reduction can't really, can't really grasp and it can't really handle. And like, there's this, there's this great ethical kind of conflict being playing out in the film between him and him and his brother in that way.
Yeah, that's a great point. And, you know, I thought it was, I looked at that exact same thing and I was able to pull something Hegelian out of that. You know, I'm not a Hegelian myself, but, you know, he's certainly correct where he's talking about the victor and the vanquished here, uh, you know, where basically uh, someone's means of domination can lead to their downfall. And so here, the brother, because he's never had to struggle, he's never had to really develop Mm -hmm. grit. You know, he lacks, you know, sort of the fortitude to be able to basically push through that pain. Um, Whereas his, his, you know, his brother, who is not genetically engineered, has basically had to struggle the entire time. He's had to suck it up. And so he's sort of developed that grit, you know, passion, perseverance, what have you. And, you know, I see this as being it's not just a downside of, uh, you know, biotech but also sort of the, the, the rise of sort of like a virtual class and so on and so forth, where you have an increasing separation between theory and practice. And, uh, you, you know, there are, there, there are like Hegelian sort of reversals uh, that can arise from this sort of thing. And uh, so, yeah, that, that definitely mm. stood out to me big time. There's another reversal going on in, um, in uh, Blade Runner 2049. Because he's genetically in, uh, enhanced, but and so which means he's like physically much stronger than the other uh, regular humans. But the, the genetically enhanced people are part of a kind of like slave class. They're not like the superhuman um, elites who have like you know like they're also infertile. That's the thing. It's like they're super strong, but they can't breed. So they're like they can't reproduce themselves, and they're basically they're basically they don't really have like the proper citizenship and rights and so on that. The, the the rest of the people have despite being actually enhanced so there's is also this kind of reversal there of like the kind of uh techno optimism optimist people that say yes we're all going to be you know free from these lesser states of you know sickness or or uh mortality or whatever um you, you want to be careful about like your political and ethical you you're, you're kind of like political uh, uh the co- political consequences of this advancement may not be end up what you think it might be like that's the kind of uh, i like these films when they kind of play around with that optimism they kind of undermine it somehow yeah absolutely and it's like you know this is obviously it's like a classic nature nurture sort of scenario but you know i think it's unavoidable the idea that you know the attitudinal dimensions you know that people develop uh you know they're shaped by their lives and and so you know that's something that people that are just like hard determinists uh, you, you know, what is it? The text, uh, what is it? Richard Lewinton, uh, I think he writes the text biology as ideology. You know, he addresses this sort of thing. Uh, yeah. and you know, that was a major scientist. I think he like deliberately resigned from certain organizations in spite of being like a top flight, you know, guy. So that is somebody who is within the, uh, this gent. Let me see this. This is, uh, his book is called Biology as Ideology, The Doctrine of DNA. And so I've only listened to it on like audiobook. but he was a leading geneticist and, uh, you know, he held the chair in zoology at Harvard. And, uh, you know, I understand that like during the during the course of his career, uh, you know, like he basically protested, uh, stepped down, resigned from, you know, various organizations because of the way they were handling some of these sort of bioethical sort of issues and stuff like that. So, you know, there's at least one scientist who is sucking it up and who's like, you know, basically uh, talking out against some of this stuff. It seems to be getting progressively, uh, you know, more rare. Yeah. It seems like all these, you know, whenever it invokes, you know, it's a very hard question, like, you know, free will, you know, that's not one of Kant's, you know, antinomies for no reason, Uh, you know, so that's very difficult, you know, the idea of determinism, uh, you know, versus free will. Uh, And then, you know, generally, I guess uh, a big, a big aspect of this is the idea of like, you know, and Fukuyama addresses this, uh, you know, human rights, human dignity, and sort of like the history of natural right. He seems yeah. to want to, like, uh, I don't know, uh, engage in a renaissance of natural right in some sense. Uh, I don't think that, uh, I don't know that the prospects for that are too good, uh, because I think that ultimately um, th- this stuff comes down to a matter of belief and, you know, it's contested. 
And so as a consequence, it's very hard to, you know, develop a determinate judgment, uh, you know, that is like, you know, politically, uh, you, you know, uh, actionable. Yeah, well, th- th- this is this is one of the points I made in the video about um, this book is that Fukuyama is right to want to want to the motivation is correct to want to reinvigorate something beyond kind of this very superficial kind of human rights that we have today because i think a lot of the time our human rights today are just kind of like um rights to kind of consumer access or kind of rights they're kind of they're kind of very commercialized kind of individualized rights that are very superficial i think and he wants to invoke something stronger but it's very hard to invoke something stronger in a liberal secular society because one of the one of the things you may encounter in, in it if you talk about natural rights in a more fundamental sense there are things that get brought up, like the idea of like divine intervention, God, um, some higher form of um, uh, uh, authority to appeal to beyond the kind of beyond this like a kind of humanistic or utilitarian kind of interest, human interest. Uh, you need something higher. And one of the themes, one of the reasons that liberalism succeeded was because it stopped all the sectarian warfare and so on, which came through those struggles over the idea of authority being given through something higher so you kind of have this like he's a liberal and the liberalism is kind of inhibiting the desire for this renaissance of natural rights i think that's kind of was my criticism of um fukuyama in the sense that he is he remains a liberal why while kind of wanting to go beyond the limits of liberalism itself yeah and when he's like quoting uh for instance like james watson i guess you know like the uh the, the, of dna fame basically uh, i took it that james watson is not a big fan of like you know human rights and human dignity as such okay, he would yeah. only admit you know the notion of like human need or something like this and um you know basically once you lose a, a big part of this has to do i think it's in like philosophy of mind so you would have like physicalism and then sort of like uh, brain uh mind brain identity theory so like somebody like elon musk you know from my perspective appears to be or maybe if not him many of the people in that realm you know seem to think that the mind is a computer and you know that's the end of the whole thing uh well then so now the question of moral agency is something that uh you know this all becomes uh you know we're talking about the numinous uh the sublime uh, and so forth, uh, you know, the status of the soul and things like this, you know, that's uh, yeah. impermissible yeah. under physicalism. Of course, you know, obviously they're trying to use consciousness to demystify consciousness. And, uh, you know, Hempel's dilemma talks about the idea that this is all predicated on something we don't presently have. It's all an ideal future physics that doesn't presently exist. And that as of as it stands is basically an external intelligible and so this would be the argument for idealism here um in some sense yeah i think i wonder what what you thought of this whole idea of of human dignity being like this is, this is kind of what fukuyama is arguing is 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 the the kind of like not just the vulgar political regulation but the kind of um the the, the kind of innate kind of um innate response being linked to the linked to a feeling of human dignity which is going to be the bulwark against this yeah uh, i don't think that's going to obtain you know so it's clear to me that he's yeah. looking to try to get some sort of secular conception of natural law that will retain human dignity or something like that yeah. and uh you know obviously this is a massive uh sort of category but it's like you know i've seen analysis of Kant, you know where Kant's appealing to like let's say the goodwill for instance and you know he's also considered the father of human dignity you know in the you know after the enlightenment and so on and so forth but the issue is that uh you know that this is something that is some sort of like noumenal you know it's like an a priori sort of uh it's either positing or it is a function of belief and now you know with the entire meta ethical conversation has to open up and uh you know <laughs> it's very difficult to do that uh in a way that is like politically um other than if you're just appealing to one's self interest basically yeah, I think well, because um, his his idea of dignity, integrity comes from Plato and 
and the idea of thymos, thumos, because the soul is divided into three, into three you have, uh, you know, reason, spirit, and desire, and the spirited part is the thymonic part, which feels a sense of integrity, recognition, and so on, which him being very in- influenced by that kind of angle of Hegel, um, that's, I'm pretty sure that's where he's getting it from. But again, that's a metaphysical conception of the soul, and it's also connected to this idea of, rec- in, in Plato, this, this idea of recollection, how do you recollect the forms? the soul needs to be harmonized in order to do this. And again, that's a kind of metaphysical, it's a metaphysical grounding, which I think kind of very much exceeds what would be acceptable in a kind of liberal. In a, yeah. In, and so, see, that's the thing is, you know, I agree that, uh, you know, as the, uh, as it goes, generally speaking, you know, that's, that's the perception and, you know, that certainly makes sense. I think that the actual Aristotelian, I'm not an Aristotelian, but the actual Aristotelian conception of the soul is harder to dismiss in the sense that to me, he's talking about like, you know, the anima in the sense that like, you know, you and I were animated in some sense, uh, you know, that this is like basically uh, that whatever the life force is that's animating us, you know, it's almost like a type of vitalism or something like this. Mm-hmm. What precisely the status of that happens to be is something that is, you know, very much unknown even to technical science and so forth. Mm-hmm. And so that this is where, you know, basically like the, uh, the soul, this is something that's irrevocable if you take yourself to be talking to another living human being. That would be, you know, that would be the argument where it's like inescapable in some sense. Uh, of course, you know, under under like physicalism, materialism, whatever, you know, this is going to be a different conception. You know, totally happy to acknowledge that. Yeah, yeah. I think I think more or less the limitations of, of, of a kind of physicalist um, and maybe even a rationalist um, perspective, I think, is is being put into question here those limits are becoming clear if i had to say one thing that basically sums up you know the entire situation from virilio to fukuyama to you know the discussion of gattaca it's basically this line in gattaca where it basically goes hey you know what there is no gene for fate 